Thank you again for joining us today. Last week, we hit the pause button and uh, we spent some time talking about racial tension. If you were out last week, or even if you were here last week, would like some more resources, let me tell you a few things that are on the website. Uh, if you go to gsfec.org, there is a link that simply says the way forward. You'll find the message. Uh, you'll find a dialogue I had with Willie Jacobs, one of our church members uh, who is black, who added a lot of understanding to the issue. And then you'll also find a, a statement. It's basically taken from last week's message, if you would like uh, something that you could read or maybe some thoughts that you could share with someone else. All those things are on our website under the way forward. You know, I mentioned last week that I certainly don't have all the answers or even a, can offer a solution to the racial tension, but I did just offer one simple step, and that was that we build relationship, um, that we look for black coworkers, black neighbors. We have meaningful conversation. We build a lasting relationship with them. And, and I just have to ask the question, I wonder how many of us since last week have made some attempt or some effort uh, getting that started. Just want to challenge you um, to work toward that in developing relationships um, with, with others. Well, racism uh, certainly is a problem with two sides. I heard from some folks this week that uh, wondered why I didn't talk so much about the other side. Well, uh, I'm white. I can only speak to myself and those like me. And so that's why I approached it from that angle. But I hope that you'll give it some serious thought and prayer about what you can do um, to help with the issue. All right, well, we're um, back into our New Testament series. Uh, you will be finishing up the book of Acts this next week and, and starting into Romans. I am going to be preaching from Romans. We didn't uh, preach from Acts. We did the series on evangelism. I am going to preach from Romans. I won't necessarily be synced up with what you're reading. Um, there's so much in Romans that we need to cover, and I'm going to approach it more from a um, thematic approach to covering the doctrine uh, that we find in the book of Romans. Romans is a very uh, comprehensive theological treatment of the gospel. It's the foundation of the gospel message. If you were just going to read one uh, New Testament book to understand the gospel, it would be the book of Romans. Paul is writing. Uh, he wrote this letter, this epistle. He wrote it to the believers, to the church at Rome. Um, we don't know how the church at Rome started. It was very likely started uh, by Jews who were present at Pentecost and then went uh, back to Rome. Uh, Paul had never been there. He has a desire to, to go. But he's writing this church, even though it wasn't a church he started, because a big part of his ministry was to disciple and train, to make sure um, that Christ's followers were being well grounded in their faith. Now, he may have had some concern about the Roman church because those who took the message of the gospel to Rome were eventually expelled from Rome under the Emperor Claudius. Uh, those Jews um, were, were pushed out of Rome. Claudius made a decree that all Jews had to leave Rome because of the, the tensions that were there. And so Paul may have been concerned that what was left when those who went and took the gospel to Rome, what was left is a lot of newer uh, Gentile believers. So he probably had some concern and wanted to be sure that they were grounded. Uh, again, Paul was anxious to get to Rome to preach the gospel there um, for a couple of reasons. One, to help that church uh, to reach new believers. But two, Paul knew that from Rome, the gospel could get to all the known world. So it would be a great way to spread the message of the gospel. Now, before we get into the first theme in Romans I want to cover this morning, let me point out just a couple of things um, from, th from the introduction, from Paul's introduction to the letter. You know, in every one of his letters, there was an introduction uh, to those that he was writing. And the first thing I want you to notice in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul introduces himself very first of all. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. He goes on to say that he's an apostle, but he starts with a servant of Christ Jesus. And in the Greek, um, that word servant is better translated slave. And there is a difference. A, a servant um, chooses whom he's going to serve. A servant may be paid a servant may be able to have some freedoms to come and go. A slave, not so much. Uh, a slave is, is pretty much wholly um, owned, uh, legally owned by the master, and that slave's livelihood and purpose is determined by the master. Paul, uh, just like James, calls himself a slave of Christ. And you know, since we've just been reading through the book of Acts, I'll point out as you've read the last few chapters in Acts this past week, you see that in Paul, that he is a slave. Regardless of the outcome, regardless of what might happen to him, he went wherever the Lord sent him. 
And wherever the Lord sent him, he depended on the Lord to see him through. You see, God, Paul's master, determined Paul's livelihood and his purpose, and Paul accomplished great things for his master because he was his slave, because he followed him. The other thing I want you to see in uh, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, Paul says to those at Rome, I long to see you so that, my, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong, that is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So you see there um, that he wants to see them to impart a spiritual gift. What is that? Again, to bring teaching to them, to make sure that they're well grounded in their faith. But then he also says for mutual encouragement. And I mention that just to remind us, every believer needs mutual encouragement. We weren't meant to live life. We weren't meant to live the Christian life alone. Um, we need encouragement. We need accountability. We need to, to process spiritual truth with other believers. Just attending a, a worship service or just watching an online service or on television is not enough. We've got to be in this journey with other people. And so I want to challenge and encourage you as the opportunity becomes available, um, reconnect to a small group. Make sure that you're staying in contact with another uh, believing friend. Now, after Paul um, states his greeting and, and his purpose, he jumps in the deep end. He um, starts where the gospel starts. If we were filming a documentary about the gospel, the opening scene in my mind would be a judge sitting at his bench, wrapping his gavel and saying, guilty, guilty, all are guilty. And that's exactly the picture that Paul gives us. God is our judge and he's calling out guilty. All of mankind is guilty. That's the starting point for the gospel message. That's the reason for the gospel message. That's the key to the book of Romans. That's why we preach Christ. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned. That's all, capital A, capital L, capital L. All mankind, all have sinned. Now, why is that foundational? It's foundational because without the acknowledgement of sin, there's no need for the gospel. Without the recognition of guilt, the message of the cross is, is pointless. If a man, if a woman, a boy or a girl doesn't recognize their sinfulness, then they have no need for Jesus and no need for atonement. And so that's where Paul begins this letter, this treatise on the gospel, with the idea that we're all guilty. In my reading this week, I ran across a, a philosopher by the name of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He was considered one of the most influential philosophers of the Enlightenment in Europe during the uh, 18th century. I want to read what he wrote in his work called Confessions. This is what he said about himself. No man can come to the throne of God and say, I am a better man than Rousseau. Let the trumpet of the last judgment sound when it will. I will present myself before the sovereign judge with the book, talking about what he's writing, Confessions, with the book in my hand, and I will say aloud, God, here's what I did, here's what I thought, and this is what I was. No man is a better man than Rousseau. Now, that's quite an arrogant claim, but even more so when you consider what has been written about Rousseau's personal life. Let me read you some of those comments written about him. He was the most despicable character in all of philosophy and literature. As a young man, he was a thief. As an adult, he lived in open licentiousness. He had multiple illegitimate children whom he sent off to orphanages. He was mean, treacherous, hypocritical, vile, and blasphemous. Now, why do I point out this about Rousseau's life, and what does it have to do with the need for the gospel? Well, when you look at a man like Rousseau, and here he claimed there was no man better than him, when you look at a man like Rousseau who has that thought or that attitude and you read about his life, you recognize for a man like Rousseau there's, there's no help and there's no hope and there's no salvation. Now, it's, it's available to him, but not without the admission of sin. It's available to him, but not until he recognized that he's depraved. That's why Paul begins this treatise on the gospel, the very first point, the starting point of the gospel message is all have sinned, all are guilty. There is no one who is not guilty. Now, in the first three chapters of Romans, Paul basically elaborates on that theme, and what he does is he divides mankind into four categories. 
and all mankind will find themselves in one of these four categories. So here's the first category. The first chapter, he describes those who are completely immoral. They're, they're vile, they're wicked, they, they live in a society that has all manner of evil available, and they have just fully immersed themselves in the cesspool. Let me read, and I won't read all of the verses, but let me read from Romans chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that all men are without excuse. So God's made himself known, but what have men done? Verse 21, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. What's he saying? They're foolish because instead of worshiping the immortal God, they're worshiping uh, idols made, made of wood or, or clay or, or, or jewels, idols of things that God has made. The creator himself made birds and, and reptiles and animals, and yet they don't worship the creator, they worship those animals. Verse 24 says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And he goes on to describe all the things that they did that were unnatural. To describe all the things that resulted from God just turning them loose. Three times it says here in chapter 1 that God gave them over. They were so depraved, the point came, and they wouldn't acknowledge God. The point came where God said, okay. You want to go down that route? You want to pursue that? Have at it. And he just let them go, and he gave them over. And the description here in, in Romans 1, if you go back and read it later, you can see a big part of that was that homosexuality was a major issue uh, during this time in the culture. And if you think that God doesn't give people over to sin, and if you think sin isn't uh, any sin, isn't the first step down a really slippery slope. Just think about in our culture today, all the different forms of perversion that have come and continue to come from that starting point. God gave them over, Paul said. He let them have their sin and he let their sin have its full effect. Well, what's the end result? Verse 29, they become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They come up with new ways of doing evil because of the sin that they've been given over to. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. Well, we look at that people group and we say, well, they're, they're clearly guilty. I mean, over and over again in Scripture, we read how vile and how wicked and how evil they are. They're clearly guilty, those who choose to not acknowledge God and ignore his righteous decrees. Well, the second group then, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, are those who are moral people. And if you read those verses in chapter 2, 1 through 11, you'll see several things about those moral people. The first thing that Paul says is that they judge others. The moral people consider themselves better than others, and they pass judgment on others, but Paul says they're just as guilty of the same sins. In fact, you know, one of the reasons that it's so easy for us to point out sins in others is we have those same roots of sin in our own lives and maybe committing those same sins. Paul says, here are these people who claim to be really moral, but they're passing judgment on others. They don't realize the reason that God is being patient and kind with them, the reason he hasn't judged them yet is his patience and kindness leads to repentance. He's patient and kind, hoping that they will understand that while he has the right to judge them and, and exercise his wrath against them, he's being patient to give them opportunity to repent. But Paul says this about these moral people, they are stubborn and unrepentant. What does that mean? Well, they won't acknowledge their guilt. They won't acknowledge their sinfulness. They think, because they're moral people, that they should be treated differently but if you look in verse 11, it says very clearly, God does not show favoritism. Just because they are good people doesn't mean that God is going to give them a pass. Just because they don't do all of the vile and wicked things of this first group doesn't mean that they're going to get by. Do you remember in Acts 10, 
the story of Cornelius. We're told that Cornelius was a good man. Um, he was very righteous. He prayed regularly. He gave uh, alms. He, he gave to the poor, to care of the poor. It, it says about Cornelius in Acts 10 that even the Jews, remember Jews didn't like Gentiles. They called them dogs. But even the Jews in Caesarea where Cornelius lived, even the Jews um, loved him. And Cornelius was probably a phenomenal example of a righteous man, a man who lived righteously. But do you remember that in Acts 10, an angel of the Lord comes to Cornelius and tells Cornelius to send for Peter so that Peter could tell him how he might be saved. How he might be saved? Why did Cornelius need to be saved? He was one of the best men in the known world at that time. Incredibly moral. Yes, and he was lost. It didn't matter how good he was. He wasn't good enough. No amount of human goodness is acceptable to God. A couple of weeks ago, Luann and I were in uh, Memphis for, uh, for a couple of days, and I had seen the, uh, the St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital before, but never seen the entire complex. I happened to be passing close by, and I turned down the street and was just amazed at that complex, the hospital, the research center, and I got thinking about Danny Thomas. I thought, man, what an incredible thing he's done to help children and their families. You know, and thinking about how much God loves children, I would think God would be certainly pleased with all that Danny Thomas has done to, to care for children. But this thought entered my mind almost simultaneously with that. If Danny Thomas didn't know the Lord, and, and I don't know his spiritual condition, but if Danny Thomas didn't have a personal relationship, hadn't accepted the work of Christ on the cross to pay for his sin and his depravity, if that didn't happen, when Danny Thomas stands before the Lord and tells the Lord about all the good things he has done, the Lord will say, that, that doesn't matter. No amount of human goodness is acceptable to God. Dwight L. Moody explained it this way. He said, if I had two apple trees and they both bore sour apples, if one apple tree had 500 apples on it and they were all sour, and the other apple tree had just two apples on it and they were both sour, then the nature of both trees is exactly alike. The nature's the same. They're sour apples. Well, when you think about the life of man, if one man is vile and wicked and, and, and full of sin, 500 evil deeds... And another man is relatively good and has just a few evil deeds. The nature of both men is the same. They're fallen, they're wicked, they're depraved, and as Moody said, they're, they're undone because they don't know Christ and they haven't trusted Christ. Well, look at the third group in chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. And, and this is something you hear a lot. If you've ever tried to share your faith with someone, this is a common argument um, that people bring up. And a lot of times when people bring up arguments or, or they have issues when you try to share the faith with them, it's typically an indicator they're probably not ready, they're still defensive, they still don't want to admit their need. But this is one of the very common arguments that I hear, and that is, what about those who've never heard the gospel? What about those who don't have a Bible? What about those who've not had someone preach or share with them the gospel message? In chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says this, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. All who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, because they show the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Listen, their consciences also bear witness. Their thoughts now accusing, now defending. What is he saying? He's saying, well, it's not a matter of whether or not you actually have the law or you've heard the law. God has already put on your heart, in, in every believer, God has put on your heart uh, a, a conscience, an awareness. There, there's no, through all of time, there's no individual, no family, no society, no nation that God has not given a conscience to. Now, that conscience may be seared, that conscience may be hardened, it may be calloused. You remember over in chapter 1, verse 18, he said, the wrath of God is revealed against the godlessness and wickedness of men, listen, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. 
God has given everyone, even if they've never heard the gospel message that you and I have heard and they've never seen the word of God, God has given them a conscience and an ability to know him. But what do men do? Because they enjoy their wickedness, they suppress the truth. The word suppress is like if you took a a, a beach ball filled with air and you tried to hold it under the water. Maybe you're in a pool and you've done this. You try to hold it under the water and it's, it's trying it's it's continuing to try to surface and you're having to work hard to keep it under the water he says that's what we do with the truth god has made the truth available so that no one has an excuse again in chapter 1 verse 18 he says they suppress the truth in verse 19 he says what may be known about god is plain to them because god made it plain to them from the creation of the world god's invisible qualities his eternal power divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Listen, even for those who've not heard the gospel preach, who don't have a copy of the word of God, God has put it in their hearts. God has put within them a conscience and an ability to know him, but they choose to suppress the truth. Well, here's the last group, and this doesn't relate to to as many of us, but the last group he mentions in chapter 2, verse 17, is the Jewish people. They were God's Uh, chosen people. He says that they rely on the law. They brag about the relationship with God. They were God's chosen people. They had a special covenant with God, and they were to keep the law. And in in keeping the law, uh, they loved to claim that they kept the law down to the smallest detail. But when you really looked at their lives, they kept perhaps the letter of law, but not the spirit of law. What what had happened? They'd become very self-righteous. They're actually very hypocritical but they were very self-righteous and they were counting on their self-righteousness to make them right with God. They considered themselves as God's chosen people better than other nations and yet they were supposed to be taking the gospel. They were supposed to be serving other nations, but in their self-righteousness, they never fulfilled the plan and purpose God had for them. And more than that, they rejected the Messiah. Jesus was not going to do what they wanted him to do and so they rejected him as Messiah. Well, those are the four groups that Paul addresses about our wickedness and our, and our depravity. So you can see in those four groups, all of mankind is addressed. Most of us probably fall in the, in the first or, or second category. But here's the bottom line for every group, for all four of those groups. The bottom line is in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. It is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God, All have turned away and have together become worthless, for there was no one who does good, not even one. Now, to use a term that we don't use much anymore, it was used years ago, it's a term that offends those who don't understand our spiritual condition. The term is total depravity. All of mankind is totally depraved. And we look and say, well, well, sure, that first group who, who are vile, who live godless lives, they're clearly depraved. So are we. Even if we're good, moral, upstanding people, we're depraved as well. There's nothing in us that's good, no matter how moral we are. There's not enough righteousness in us to overcome our depravity. Well, as we've looked at the opening uh, theme of Romans, the total depravity, the total guilt, the wickedness of man, we have to ask the question, why is it important, especially for those of us who've trusted Christ, why is it important for us to, to think about and understand depravity. Well, the very first thing is this. All of us need to recognize, apart from Christ, we have no hope. You know, there are people, even within our church on a regular basis, within other churches in our city and our nation, there are people who hear the gospel message regularly, but they're still trying to be good enough, to be moral enough, to be self-righteous enough, to be accepted by God. We need to understand total depravity so that we understand that apart from Christ, we have no hope. Again, Paul said in in Romans 3, 10 through 12, there is no one righteous, not one. All have turned away. They've all become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Here's the second reason we need to understand depravity, and that is 
that as believers, as those who have accepted what Christ did on the cross, as those of us who have rejected self-righteousness and recognized that we can't be good enough to be accepted by God, and it's only because Christ died for us and gave us his righteousness, that's the only way we're acceptable in God's sight, that should cause us to continually express gratitude to Christ for what he's done for us. That needs to be a part of our daily lives that we recognize. Not that, not that we beat ourselves up and wallow in our depravity, but that we daily recognize, you know what? Apart from Christ, I would have no hope. And apart from Christ, I couldn't possibly be acceptable to God. The third thing about understanding depravity is to recognize uh, the importance of confession and repentance. You know, when you look at what happened, especially in the first chapter to those who were living wicked lives when God gave them over, when you look at how sin progresses and how rapidly progressive sin is, you want to be careful as a believer that you don't let sin take root in your life. Listen, just because you've come to Christ and you've rejected a sinful lifestyle doesn't mean you won't still be tempted to sin, doesn't mean you won't still fall into sin. But hopefully, if you're walking with Christ, anytime you sin, the Spirit of God who lives in you is going to speak to you about that sin. And, and you have a, a choice at that moment. You can either refuse him, not listen to him, and that begins to develop a seared conscience and a hard heart where it makes it harder to hear the conviction of the Spirit, or you respond to him, you confess and repent. Sin is a dangerous, slippery slope. One little step can lead to just an incredibly devastating slide. Depravity of man, of all of us as men, needs to remind us of the importance of regular confession and repentance. And then, and then finally, most importantly, I think, is that the depravity that Paul introduces here in Romans in showing man's need for the gospel, that depravity, whether it's someone who lives incredibly wicked or someone who seems to be morally very good, we need to be reminded that everyone needs the gospel. It may be tempting. You may have a neighbor that's a, that's a really, really good person, maybe someone like Cornelius, a really good person, but if they don't know Jesus, their depravity is going to cost them eternally. Everyone needs the gospel. Well, I know that depravity is not a fun subject to talk about, um, but I think we need to, as we look at the gospel message, as we are going to walk through the book of Romans, we need to understand that that's where we start, with an understanding, a recognition of who we are as the sinful people. When we have that understanding and we have that recognition, that moves us into right relationship with the Father. Would you pray with me? And would you take just a moment and ask the Lord what he wants you to glean uh, from this word today? It, it may be just the reminder that there are people in your life that are good people, but you still need to share the gospel with them because apart from Christ, their righteousness is not enough. It may be a reminder in your own life of how careful you need to be about letting sin take root, how you need to regularly uh, keep a short account with God. When, when sin occurs in your life and the Spirit convicts you, you need to immediately be responsive and, and confess and, and repent. It may just be a reminder that you need to daily express thanks to the Lord Jesus for what he's done for you. Father, I do thank you for the clarity of your word. God, I, I thank you that in spite of our incredible depravity, you were willing to send the Lord Jesus to die for us. God, I don't know why when, when you saw how vile and wicked uh, men were becoming, why you didn't just as you did in the days of Noah, wipe out all mankind. But God, I thank you that you loved us enough that you were willing to send Christ. And God, I pray for those listening today who are trying to live really good moral lives to be acceptable to you, God, I pray that you would help them understand that there is not enough goodness in us, that apart from Christ, we have no hope. God, for the believer listening today, would you just remind them how important it is to be sharing the truth of the gospel message with everyone around them, even good moral people. And Father, we just thank you again for Jesus. We ask that you help us when we're tempted to sin, when we give in to sin, to listen to the conviction of your spirit and to confess and to repent and to turn from that sin.
so that it doesn't take root in us and destroy our lives and our witness. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.